I welcome, delighted that you've all come in here rather than being out there in the beautiful spring sunshine. I'll introduce myself briefly so you know why I'm here. Um, I probably essentially, uh, the reality is that I'm here because I used to work with the director of the Sustainability Institute, Alan Jones. Um, and we did some pretty influential world changing ourselves and therefore he remembered <laughs> when he was thinking about who was going to lead this session today he suggested that I do it and I was delighted to. I should say that I'm, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a trainer, I'm a practitioner, I'm a campaigner. So what I've done today is to try and kind of suck out of my head and out of my know-how some lessons that I'm going to try and share with you um, in the first half of the session and give you by just basically taking you through a case study which I hope will illustrate a theory of how you change the world. Um, and then in the second half what we're going to do is do some workshopping where you will use my theory or adapt my theory to any to a number of campaigns. You'll be able to choose which of those which campaigns you'd like to try and um, work on. So you'll be creating an imaginary campaign. And then at the end we'll bring your campaigns back together and we'll talk about them and we'll see whether we think they might be successful in the real world. Um, but uh, I think really to explain a little bit where I'm coming from, I've been campaigning primarily on climate change for the last 25 years. I've done lots of different kinds of campaigning. I've done, I started off with Greenpeace driving little orange boats. Uh, back then, it was before even climate change really reared its head as an issue, we were doing things like trying to stop CFCs and uh, trying to stop nuclear submarines and so on. And then I moved into doing much more policy-based campaigning and working with parliamentarians. I also started something called the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group on, a, on climate change, which was actually turning big businesses, and particularly the leaders of big businesses, into campaigners themselves. So I'm very interested in trying today, trying to broaden your sense of what a campaigner is and who, who the good people are to activate, who the right organisations are to create change, because they are not always, we're not going to talk very much about conventional campaigning as you might imagine it today, we're not going to talk very much about what a Greenpeace can do, I'm going to talk about how I think change really happens and those organisations are a part of that ecosystem. Um, but then only a part of it. And in the example I'm going to use, in a way they will be their sort of background noise. And I'm going to talk a bit more about how change can be achieved through very different routes. And I hope that will be interesting and stimulating. Um, but I would say, right from the outset, campaigning is an art, not a science. And my theory of how you do it will be different. There are many people, you know, many books have been written on it. I haven't read many of them because I just tend to do it. <laughs> but but um, everybody will have a different take on this. This is just my take. So I'm very open to challenge and questions, and I hope you'll find it useful. But before we start uh, with the formal bit that I'm going to talk about, I wanted to show you a video that I made uh, a couple of years ago which is radically different to almost everything else I'm going to talk about, but the difference, I think, makes it useful.
is, I think, when I think about campaigning, when I dream about campaigning, I want to make emotional, beautiful things like that that are very metaphorical, that are very symbolic, that are on social media, that people can share. Really, my opening point today is that that isn't very often how real political ha change happens. We don't often achieve change by creating beautiful pieces of social media and sharing it. And I think we tend, at this point in time, to believe that that is how we <laughs> create change. However, that's not completely irrelevant. The, the, what the, the, at the end of that um, video, the, the model drew a circle around her eye. And what I'm going to talk about today is a case study which is around a campaign that that circle related to, which is a campaign for uh, net zero emissions at the Paris, um, the, at the Paris negotiations that happened at the end of last year on climate change. I'll come back to it. But what I want to do is to talk through, in a fairly structured way, what I think are the key elements of campaign strategy. When I say strategy, I am talking about really the deep-rooted pattern of how we try and create change. I'm not going to be talking so much about tactics, which is how do you run a petition or how do you make a video, or you know, those are the sort of local elements of a campaign. For me, really good campaigning starts with strategy, and that's what I'm going to try and share with you today. So the elements of campaign strategy, you need a goal. You need to work out who you're going to influence. You need to do research. You need to find allies. You can't win a campaign by yourself. Even a single organization cannot, even however big it is, can't win a campaign. Campaigns are always won through alliances. And the better, stronger, deeper, wider your alliances, the more likely you are to win. You need to build momentum, which is where a lot of the tactical work comes in, which as I said, we're not going to dwell on that much, but you may well want to dwell on more in your, um, in your working groups. And then you need to force a decision, which means you know, try and get a decision either way. And then you need to start again, because I'll come to it at the end. Campaigning on almost any issue under the sun pretty much never ends. It's a relentless thing, and you have to be quite relentless as a so the case study I'm going to focus on is net zero. I apologise. Believe me, when the world of climate change, net zero is a refreshingly simple idea. It basically is, says that if humanity is going to survive beyond the end of this century, we need to achieve what the equivalent of zero emissions. And the, the science actually says we need to do that by the middle of this century, which is incredibly ambitious. And the net bit means that it's basically saying it's not that we have to completely get rid of all carbon dioxide emissions, all greenhouse gas emissions, it's that we have to get them down as far as we can, and then those that we can't avoid, we have to balance out with what are called sinks. So either forests or maybe technological ways of soaking up carbon. The technological ways of soaking up carbon and the greenhouse gases are very difficult, so basically we're talking forests and, and things like that. Um, it was... This was a campaign that was run in the run-up to, I'm sorry, for those of you who aren't that familiar with climate change politics, at the end of last year, there was a very important global UN conference on climate change that was held in, in Paris, and world leaders went to it, and it came to a pretty good agreement. It was, kind of, it was certainly spun as good news. It was actually designed as a conference that couldn't fail, because previous attempts at this, to do this had failed so horribly. So it couldn't really have failed, but still, it was a success. And one of the things that was very successful about it was that, as, as I'll come to at the end, there was an agreement to something like net zero, um, which is really important. It's a very radical stretch target, and it's the fact we didn't know that it was going to happen. The governments basically said, we need to get rid of greenhouse gas emissions by the by some time in the second half of this century. What was interesting about it was that it's a very, it was a complex campaign that was run actually by one woman who was incredibly well networked. And I think that that's, I wanted to really talk to you about networking and how important that is for campaigns. I think that's interesting. Her name's Fahana Yamin. She's an environmental lawyer and she's been working with lots of different players in the sort of formal and informal political system for a long time. She led this. She came up with the idea of net zero. It was highly political. It was very much targeted at politicians. That's very important. I mean, you don't get system change by targeting anyone else other than politicians, actually. Politicians are the people who control the way in which our systems work. Um, and 
uh, you know, however dull <laughs> it, it might be to try and target them. I think if we're talking strategy, the people in the end you usually want to change, if you're talking about big, if you're talking about changing the world, it's usually politicians. Just as an aside, as I think in the political world that we all live in these days, particularly on social media, I think it's very easy to uh, to confuse two areas of campaigning and of, of sort of of how you change the world. There is identity politics, where I think we're seeing huge amounts of progress and a lot of contest, a lot of contest at the moment. Identity politics. You know, there are some political things you want to be in place, and politicians can certainly do the wrong things. We're seeing in the south. Southern states of America, where they're, you know, they're, they're passing legislation at the moment that makes life more difficult for uh, the LGBT community, for example. But generally, identity politics can be pursued by us all, you know, changing, changing one another's attitudes. Politicians don't necessarily have to get involved. And it's very sort of personal, and it very much relates to things that we can relate to in our to, to things that we can easily relate to in our everyday life. That's identity politics. And then there's what I would call big politics, which is things like how do you stop climate change, which work in a very different way. And what I'm talking about today are the big politics, because I think we obviously want to make progress on identity politics, but if we don't, for example, stop climate change, it will be irrelevant <laughs> how we feel about the, the gay people in our community. And in fact, they will have a much worse time, because you know, we all know that as things get tougher, the, the racism, sexism, homophobia, all those things will get worse. So. That's, I think that, that, that in your brain, when you're thinking about campaigning, I think it's really useful to think about those two things. I'm not saying identity politics is unimportant, but if you use the same strategies as you might use for identity politics to try and do this kind of politics, we're likely to fail. So, linked to that, in this campaign that I'm going to talk you through, social media was almost irrelevant, it didn't really play a role. Um, and the other thing to say about it is it was only one of many, many, many campaigns that were all leading up and all building momentum up towards this point in Paris. But in a way, it was one of the most important ones because it actually said, this is the change we need to see, and it actually got the politicians to adopt this change. So the, uh, uh, on each of my slides, I'm going to try and sort of leave you with an insight. And I've just given you quite a lot of insight. <laughs> um, my goal in the way that I'm going to take you through this is to give you some sort of fairly a simplistic view of how things work and then elaborate on it. So I've done some elaborating. But the insight here is that if you're campaigning, if you decide to do a campaign, you will never be campaigning in a vacuum. There will always be other people who are campaigning. And that is a good thing. You are not in competition with those other people. You are being supported by them, potentially. But you have to build, again, this is back to building allies. You need to build relationships with them. You need to know what their goals are, what their assets are. And ideally, you want to try and bring them into your campaign in some way, or work out how your campaign actually can support what they're doing. You need to look for those, those, those joins. Um, so you need to find your niche, and you need to collaborate. So set your goal being, when you sit, start starting from, if you were starting to build a campaign, the first thing you need to do is set a goal. As I've described already, this campaign was very much about a goal. The goal was to establish a goal, <laughs> was to get agreement around a goal. And the, the goal was net zero, zero carbon emissions by the middle of this century. The good things about this goal is that it's ambitious. It's um, good to have ambitious goals because if you want to change the world, you want to change the world. You don't want to do it a little bit, you want to try and do it as much as possible. It's also good to have ambitious goals because they're actually easier to mobilise people around. If you say you want to make the world a little bit better, you won't excite that many people. If you say, if you're bold, if you're showing real leadership, then you can get more people excited. As long as you're also realistic. I don't know whether I put this one of my points, but yeah, it's achievable. Um, and we'll go on to a moment in the research that there was research done that made it clear that this was achievable. Um, and critically easily communicable. It may, it may seem to you that net zero isn't very easy to communicate, but it was basically saying that there are much more difficult, complex ways of talking about what we need to achieve on climate change. There's been, for years, there's been this idea that we want to achieve two degrees, to limit ourselves to a two degrees rise in temperature, and that, for me, is really, really abstract, whereas saying we just need zero emissions or the equivalent of zero emissions is pretty bold, it's pretty clear. It's a zero. It's a zero that, as, as you saw in the video, you can paint around an eye as a, as a demand. It's pretty simple. Um, and it's measurable. Uh, your campaign goal 
it, it, this is measurable in two sense. The goal that this campaign was trying to get the world to adopt is measurable, obviously, and it's complex to measure that kind of a target, but it's possible. It also was measured, the campaign success was measurable either. That wouldn't have been an agreement out of Paris, or it wasn't an agreement out of Paris, you could see. And that's important because if you're trying to get people excited and engaged in a campaign, at some point you want to be able to say, are we successful? If you're looking for funding, you definitely need to be able to say, are you successful? But also if you're just looking to keep your partners, your friends, your colleagues, your allies on board, you need to be able to say, look, we're, we're doing something. And measurement is key for that. And the Net Zero campaign, as I said, it was nested within many, many different campaigns that were going on. Um, so the insight here is simplicity is power. You need to be make your goal as simple as possible, and actually your campaign as simple as possible, because in communications terms, it's incredibly easy for those of us who care about things like climate change or many, many of these issues. I, I currently work on something called TTIP, which is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and everybody who works on TTIP inevitably becomes a geek about TTIP because it's a very geeky thing. But that is a that as you know, when we're trying to talk to the public, we have to be trying, trying to be as ruthless as possible and say, how do we try and make this simple? And it's not easy. I run a workshop this week on how on earth to be simplified. What is a very complex campaign? Simplicity, very important. You need that said, you also need to know your stuff, and I'll come on in, in a moment to talking about research. So once you've said what your goal is, you need to think about who is it that you're trying to influence. Um, net zero targeted politicians. As I've already said, politicians are almost always a good target for a campaign that's trying to achieve system change. There are sometimes other good targets, but even if you, the, the thing that you think you want to change isn't a politician, if what they're trying to, which usually isn't, for example, we're trying to change the energy system, if we're trying to get a campaign on climate change, but the people who have most control over our energy system are not the energy companies, they're the politicians. If you wanted to change business habits of any kind, if you wanted to change whether business should pay taxation, which may be one of the case studies we'll, we'll, we'll go on to later, governments are the ones who have that, that control. So I think it's good to remember that they are usually, I think generally if you were coming out a campaign, and it, and it could be any level of government, we're talking about the, you know, governments gathering together at the United Nations, which is arguably the highest level, um, though the, uh, the United Nations is relatively weak. <laughs> it is where all the governments get together. Um, but you can go all the way down to your local government or to, if you've got a parish council, you know, but, but generally those are the players that have influence over system change. So that's your final, you put the people you're actually trying to change in this campaign were politicians. Um, but you not only do you want to target the politicians, you need to work out who influences them. Some of the people who influence politicians most are other politicians. So if you can find some politicians and get them on your side, that helps, particularly if they're the same party. The, all politicians have advisors. Those advisors are sometimes in government, sometimes they are the people who work for, for policy, think tanks, or whatever. They're, those people are accessible. We're talking about change at this level. They're constantly looking for ideas. They're constantly trying to work out how to solve problems, how to come up with new policies. You can reach them. The media obviously influences politicians. If you so finding ways to talk to the media is very important. And the public also does, should influence politicians. So quite often you find as a campaigner, this is where it gets interesting. If you're in a if you're in a situation as we are now where we have the Tory party in control, most people who want to change the world are not Tories. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, it's a general, <laughs> that's a general rule. And that means, and people who are not Tories tend to really be quite upset by Tories and think that they're an alien being. What you have to do, if you are to be a good campaign, is you have to set your own preferences aside and you have to say, okay, these are the people in power. I need to talk to these people. Will me being kind of a crusty, left-wing, radical, aggressive activist help me talk to these people? The answer is almost certainly no. In fact, it probably shoot yourself in the foot. And the climate change movement has been very good at this. With the Tory party in this country, we have tended to be, to kind of really uh, totally build relationships with the progressive side of 
politics and completely ignored the Tories. And as a result, as soon as the Tories got into power, by surprise recently, they dismantled every single piece of climate change legislation. So they really, it's not only that they, they didn't care about climate change, they actively hated the climate change movement. And that was a total failure on the part of the climate change movement to build those relationships. There's no reason why climate change should not be a Tory issue. They like conserving nature. There's all sorts of things that are kind of potentially in the DNA of that party. We did not talk to them. So as a campaigner, you don't always just want to say, well, I feel like this, therefore, if anybody is not like me, I can't talk to them. You need to be the opposite of that. You need to try and be as sort of selfless as possible in a way. And I don't mean as in you've got to go and sacrifice your life to this campaign. It's when you come into a campaign, you have to say, dismantle your identity and say, well, how can I be most useful? Not how can I express myself? And that for us at this point in history is quite difficult because we're all kind of programmed to express ourselves. And we all feel that if we, in fact, that's another problem with identity politics is that it tells us that you know, the most radical thing we can do is be ourselves. Not true if what you actually want to do is change the world. If you actually want to change the world, you have to know how to talk to people in power. You have to know how to influence them. And going around expressing yourself to your mates on social media will not achieve. I'm talking to myself as well as everyone else, and I find it very interesting. Um, now, net zero actually mostly talks to politicians, peers, and advisors because the people running the campaign were from that world. Um, and in the long run, if you want to create this kind of change, you probably want to try and be in that world yourself because it's incredibly useful if you are respected by people who run governments or respected by people who advise governments, your ability to make this kind of change is very great. So if you're thinking about a future in this world, I would think about going into that kind of ecosystem of influence and policy making and so on, um, which is not necessarily, as I said, the same as going into a campaigning organisation. So the campaigning organisations are very smart, and they do know how to talk to those people, but they also are bound up in this world that they need to keep appealing to the people who also have radical which kind of get them stuck into the sort of shouty shouty mode, which doesn't always work. So um, it's worth thinking about. Next stage of a campaign is do your research. If you are going to influence anybody in power, research should help you. Again, there's a little, I have to say, there's a kind of brackets around this because the Tory government we have at the moment is extraordinarily uninterested in evidence and most of the things they do are based on ideology but still generally in the world the ge generally the world we hope is a bit more rational and even the Tories want will, will want to point to evidence if you wanted them to do something and there wasn't any evidence to support it they would find it hard to do it would be hard for you to have a sensible conversation with them going up, up to the global level what net zero did was really base its work on two important pieces of research and I say do your research, it's actually misleading. Net Zero did very little research themselves. They found the people who already were brilliant at climate science and the people who already were brilliant at economic research and went to them and said, you know, how, you know, is, this is our hypothesis, our hypothesis is that we need this goal, is this right, does this fit the science? And in fact, they come to the conclusion in the first place that Net Zero was, was the, the right goal by understanding the climate science. But then they went back and they that they had an ongoing dialogue with the scientists. And the same with the economists. They basically need, if you're going to say we ought to do X, Y, or Z, if that X, Y, or Z is going to have any potential economic impact, you need to be able to explain that. Whether that's at a very local level or at an international level. And if you're going to need new technology to achieve change, which isn't always the case, then you need to understand whether that technology is there. And excitingly, Net Zero were able to say this is possible, this very different, this very rapid transition to a very different world is possible. And that then gave them, that was their kind of calling card when talking to governments and other decision makers. So I would say research is the backbone of the campaign. There's another kind of research um, which is, doesn't apply so much with this campaign, so say it's an elite campaign. But if you've got a campaign where you do think that public opinion is something you want to go for, doing the research into public opinion and trying to understand what different parts of the public don't never see the public as a you know as a whole lump. It's, as I've just said, there are lots of the reason the Tories got into power is that there are lots of people in this country who are who respond to their messages because they feel differently about the world than maybe most of the people. I'm making wild assumptions that, <laughs> that you come to a meeting like this. You're probably a bit more progressive than than Middle England, for want of a better word. 
but it's good to understand what motivates people and there are lots of different and interesting systems for doing that and I'm happy to talk more about that. It's another part of my kind of core argument today, but if you want to talk more about how do you understand what kind of campaign messages, what kind of campaign uh, narratives and so on, talk to different audiences, that's something I do quite a lot of work on, that's very interesting. But, as I say, it's not always necessary. You don't always, you know, the answer is not always to get millions of people to sign a petition. It may be to be in the right place at the right time and influencing them. Um, and then, once you've done your research, as I say, or lots of these things happen in parallel, you need to find your allies. Um, I've already made this point, but allies are absolutely fundamentally important in campaign. The net zero were interesting in that they started, actually their starting point was that Fahana Yamin, who led net zero, had for years been the leading advisor to something called the Alliance of Small Island States. Now, those of you who are not familiar with Ghanaian politics, it won't be very difficult for you to realise why the Alliance of Small Island States are quite important in global climate politics, because they are literally already being worked out. Their, their islands are disappearing. And yet yeah, they are governments, they have a seat in the UN, they're there. Um, but they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing, they're, some of them are actually having to move their populations off their islands already, it's so bad. Um, and not only do they, they're vulnerable to sea level rise, but they're also vulnerable to hurricanes and storms, and they're getting wiped out on a regular basis. So they, they tend to be a very interesting player. So net zero builds a relationship with them, not only. So the equivalent is you're look, looking, look for the victims. <laughs> look for the organisations that represent the victims or the people who are suffering. And they may not be people who are already, whose main job is to campaign on this issue, but look for them because they are the people who have the, basically have the moral high ground on an issue. And also in this case, they, had, they, they, were, they weren't powerful, but they were in, that they were in the world where power of power. There's another group called the Elders. Um, I don't know whether you've heard of the Elders. It was sort of coalesced around Nelson Mandela, another sort of great, good ex-statesman around the world. Uh, and they were essentially brought into the climate change debate to represent you know, the ideal statesman, not the real people who are actually in power now and have to deal with the messiness of power, but people who could have the vision to see the future. They were strong advocates for a net zero, a net zero target. And they, again, they're like the, they were the advisors. So look for the advisors. And they were advising the process and advising the system. And they also had a voice in the media, which helped. Another ally with the youth caucus, which are, um, doesn't sound very sexy or exciting, but in every UN negotiation, there's always young people are always kind of in a formal way invited in. And on climate change, this is very important because, as with the small island states, the people who are going to be most damaged by climate change are the youth. Um, and the youth played a very active role around the net zero campaign. And they did things like paint this circle, this zero around their eye, and sort of go be in the UN meetings wearing the zero, and basically calling the um, calling the politicians to account and saying, sort of bearing witness and saying, are you going to save our futures or not? Future or not? Big businesses. There was a group of big businesses. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Basically, it was led by businesses like. Richard Branson from Virgin, Elon Musk from, um, his brilliant, sorry, uh, what's it called? Anybody remember what Elon Musk? Tesla, Tesla, and that sort of thing. But also bigger businesses than that with less of an obvious stake in climate future. IKEA, lots of the big, kind of nicer, more progressive businesses came together. And as I've said before, that is very useful. Having people you don't expect to be allies or people of is very important. And also people who you expect to be kind of pragmatic. Businesses play in the campaign by saying, well, you know, they, they deal with the real world, they're not fantasists, they, they have to keep a business going. If they say something's possible, then that's, that makes that much more credible. And then there was the little campaign called The Future, which is what the video that I showed you at the beginning, which is the part of all this that I was actively involved with because I, I ran The Future, um, which was an attempt to get a much broader, younger, cooler subset of people interested in the campaign. I would say that was the least important of all of this, but it was nice to have, and the people 
who were running this and doing the boring stuff and walking the corridors of the UN and having the meetings, they really liked the fact that there were sort of beautiful, exciting things happening. I don't think that the effect we had was at all on social media. The, the work we did with the future on this was not widely shared, but it did have direct impact on, on the negotiations. So we didn't have to have millions of people seeing those videos for them to have an impact. The people who were in the rooms trying to do the deals saw those videos and saw young people coming into the negotiations with the circle made around their eye. So it's, it's interesting. Again, there are ways. It's how do you hack power is really what you're looking for. What's the quickest route to power? And it may not always be finding million people to share a video. And the other thing that Net Zero had was I, I, I may have coined this idea. I don't know whether any of you are aware of the idea that there are track one and track two processes in politics. Now, I'll, I'll talk about this. Track one is formal negotiations. Track two are when governments talk to, to each other in informal ways. And most deals of every kind have a track two element, which sort of forerun the formal deal. So it's where people can come away from the actual, you know, the sort of sweaty business of staying up all night and trying to negotiate a deal. And they can take a step back and they can explore different things and they can be open and they can be honest with one another and they're not they're sort of not on their best behaviour. Now around Paris we actually had something I would go deeper, which I would call which is track three, which is there were lots and lots of networks of people who have been working together on climate change for years and who run very, very different organisations, who run the World Bank, who run bits of the UN, who are very influential in different bits of business and so on. So the insight here is, back to my point before, the most influential groups are not necessarily campaign groups. There are many, many other players who you want to think about and think really. So when you're thinking about how you design your campaign, think who are the people you might want to, who are your allies? Think about the people you might not expect to be your allies and think about whether you could get to them. Also, think about your mates. <laughs> Obviously, uh, those of you who are students won't yet have probably a network of influential mates. But as you get older, you'll be amazed, particularly if you work in this kind of area, your mates get more and more, and more influential, and that's just how the world works. But uh, what you do have is parents, or what you do have is teachers, what you do have, you know, at any institution you're a part of, there's probably someone seeming you might have a relationship or you might be able to access. And it's always worth look, look for power and look for influence and work out how you can access it. Then, so once you've got, so you've got everything together, you've got your research, you know who your targets are, you know who your allies are, then there's a bit called building momentum, which is what most of us would see as a campaign. And I, we could, I could spend an hour on this, and I'm going to spend very little time on it, because I think that most of you would know what, you know, knows what a petition would look like and so on in the kind of mass campaigning. But I will talk a little bit about elite campaigning. So what happened under Net Zero was there were lots and lots of meetings and networking. There were lots of formal meetings, there were lots of semi-formal track two meetings where organisations like Chatham House, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Chatham House, it's the Royal Institute for International Affairs and it's a classic track two organisation where people come together to talk about these issues. And track three, where people are just going out to dinner together, people from different delegations or people for the experts are you know, are you know getting drunk with the people who are trying to solve all this. And all of this goes on. And through all this, there's this woman called Fahali Amini who was trying to be everywhere, as well as having a large family of her own, and on in the world, trying to have as many of these conversations before. And she did it very, very effectively. Um, another key part of momentum building is reporting your progress. So Net Zero had a map where they, all the governments that had said that they wanted to adopt net zero as a target, they wanted net zero to be an outcome from Paris. Every time one of those, you know, they, they put it on a map. And that was very confidence building for the target. So if you, for example, you were trying to get councillors to sign up in a local government, as soon, as soon as you've got one, two, three, four, you just say, can I put you on the list? Can I then go and show the other councillors that I've got you? You're constantly, so what a map helps build momentum and helps give the, your target confidence that they're not alone. People don't like acting alone on radical things, generally. As I said, protests and marches and viral videos and petitions and all of these things, I will call the cultural movement music. And they are, they can be important. Without them, we would not be anywhere on climate change if there had not been a long history of protest, obviously. Um, but they're not always. And I would risk repeating myself, they are not always the most important things to do. And think about who you're targeting. 
it might be that one, what to you looks like quite boring article in a local paper will be more influential than you getting a thousand people to see a video on, on Facebook or something. It's, it's really, it's about who's interesting. There is, I'm going to labour this point because I just think it's so important, that the world, the Venn diagram of social media and political power, <laughs> there's hardly any <laughs> overlap. Is that they just people in political power do not respond to social media campaigns. They can pretty much ignore them. If they want to do something, it will help that something's there. But they do not, you know, we saw it with Bring Back Our Girls, for example, as a particularly good one. Obviously, the Nigerian government and the, the, the warlords who had those girls were not interested in social media. It was a massive campaign, it was backed by everybody to Michelle Obama, did actually achieve its goals. It, you know, they were probably. The people in that campaign probably didn't have the access to do things, to do anything else. So it's, you know, you want to do something. But if you're thinking about how do I change the world, think about access, influence, making the case, research. Right? You know, it's a much more complex process than just getting a lot of people to say, oh, we want to change the world. So my insight there, social media is not usually the best way of creating political space. And political space is a useful concept. Political space is a metaphor that we use a lot in campaigning. It's, does a government feel safe in adopting a position? If they do, the political space is there. And there's lots of ways, all the things I've talked about, research and knowing that their colleagues and peers in other countries or in, you know, within the same country you know, are doing it, that will give you political space. A positive media article will give you political space. Lots and lots of ways that you can build political space. It's a useful thing, it's really useful. And finally, nearly finished, you need to force a decision. This isn't always necessary. In this campaign, a decision was already going to be made. In fact, the whole campaign was predicated on the fact that governments were going to come together in Paris and were going to decide something. Um, but what Fahana and the Net Zero campaign did was that they've made sure that the decision was going to be that their thing, net zero, was on the table. And they did that by, at the point of decision, in Paris, they were there, and they were, right up to the last minute, they were creating new kind of constellations and groupings of leading governments that they had relationships with already, and were getting them to advocate for that. And they were pushing, pushing, pushing right up to the minute. But some, in some cases, this is, as I say, not an example, that you may actually need to find a way of actually making the decision happen, a political decision. And that's quite difficult. <laughs> uh, but in it comes about, if the political space is there, it, it's, uh, quite often it'll be, it's quite often it's beyond your control. For example, at the moment, we're going to about to have see some decisions made on taxation, uh, I think. You know, we're seeing, and, and you know, that, so whoever got the Panama Papers didn't know they were going to get those Panama Papers. You never quite know how a decision is going to be made, but you want to look for the opportunity. If you were a taxation campaigner, you've suddenly been given an opportunity to force a decision now because you've got this great, this great, this, this great sort of ally in, in all this new data and all this new scandal. So, but just to talk about our case study here, as I said, they were successful. The wording was different. They got the goal. The, the agreement said to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases in the second part of the century. So my insights there, some great successes look very boring. And some of the most important things you can do to, to save the world may be a bit boring, but this is was it was a great success, believe me. And then what you have to do once you've achieved something with a campaign is as I said, you have to start again. Everybody after Paris took a holiday, so you do you know, looking after oneself the campaign is very important. But most decisions, even really important ones, are just a step in the way to creating change. Change is an ongoing process, always. And in a way, uh, all the Paris Agreement was was the world's government saying, we want to do this. The actual real politic of them actually doing it is much more complex and will require people like Fahana, like me, like all the other climate change campaigns to keep working for the rest of our lifetimes. <laughs> and so, 
one of the things you constantly need to do in campaigns is sort of keep your energy up and also refresh it and think about what's the next step, what do I do next, how do I, what's the new piece of research I need. So at the moment they're doing lots of research on how do you implement this in re agreement and, uh, and, and it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Um, and you don't, if you're lucky you'll have a campaign where you can see, start seeing success quite early. When you're changing really big things, sometimes you won't know whether you've been successful. And you have to be able to kind of live with that uncertainty. Like I said, that the climate change is such a big issue that most other issues you can see progress in that. So my last campaign <laughs> insight is campaigns never end. Um, you know, a phase of a campaign, a particular, you know, a camp a, you know, the net zero campaign may die in the next year or so if it really gets embedded. But that the efforts behind it and the, the direction, the campaigns to achieve it will have to continue. So I'm going to go back, um, I'm just going to remind you of what the key elements were that I've talked to you through, and then we're going to have uh, 10 or 20 minutes, however long, for you to ask me questions about this, and then we are going to workshop some ideas, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But, so, goal setting, deciding who you're trying to influence, doing your research, finding your allies, building momentum, forcing a decision, starting again. That, for me, is the, sort of, the essence of a campaign strategy, and I hope it's going to be helpful for you. Before we do questions, um, just to have in the back of your mind, for the workshops, the idea is that in each of your table, you're going to, tables, you're going to try and come up with a campaign based on this outline or your version of it. And so uh, you can choose a campaign if you want, but some of the ideas that I had coming into this that you might want to try and develop a campaign around was, uh, and I'm trying, to, I've Deliberately, these are a little bit vague because I want you to set your own goals. I'm not going to give you what the goal is, but a campaign something around tax evasion would be one of them. Another the campaign around veganism is another one. I did, I mean, again, you would only want to work on this if they have interest to you. We thought one more relevant to students, rent control would be another interesting campaign. And those of you who are interested in climate change, trying to, a campaign around promoting renewable energy or trying to get a 100% renewable energy target in the UK would be one that I would suggest. It. So while, you're, while we're doing questions, have a think about which of those you might be interested in doing, and then we'll move into the workshop in a bit in a minute, but that's, where, that's, that's our starting point. This is my argument, this I think is how you can change the world. Any questions? <laughs> Question. I haven't quite sort of thought it through yet, so this is kind of a thinking aloud. Um, I work in the field of education known as global learning or global citizenship, and a very strong element of that is about developing critical thinking skills in young people. Um, and one area that I find very interesting in trying to change the world is um, the balance to be had between developing critical thinking skills and what is often a sort of cynical approach to big business. And, and the possibility of working from within a big business and through their corporate social responsibility agenda. And I find that a very interesting tension and I wonder what your opinion on it is. And I'm thinking of sort of big companies like Unilever who have done some huge departure from some of their very immoral previous practice. So I'm interested to hear what you feel about that. I think it's, I've, done, I've done quite a lot of work in that area. I've never worked within a big business, but I've worked very, very closely with big businesses and trying to encourage them to become change agents. And it's undeniable that some of them are really shifting and are becoming change agents, both in the way in which they do business and how the way that they function in the world, and also in the way that they are increasingly willing to step up and say things, for example, on climate change, to say, we can't do this by ourselves, we need very powerful action by government, we support that, we welcome it, you can regulate the hell out of us because we need that sort of thing, and that's quite a radical thing to do. But as an individual, um, it's very, it, it is difficult. I think I would say it's definitely an aspiration, but if you are coming, you know, if you're going in an entry level job in a big organisation, your ability to influence it is um, it influences its culture and the way it does business is very limited to start off with. But all of these strategies take place. So I think you need to go in, you need to decide where you want to be in the business, you need to sort of 
talk when you're being interviewed to see whether you, that they seem to open to the idea of change. And I think you probably need to choose the businesses that you think do want to change. So don't go work for Michelle or Monsanto, but Unilever or Ikea. And the, one of the reasons that Unilever and Ikea are doing what they're doing is because they know that it attracts talent. You know, it is part of their, their agenda. It's, it's difficult. I mean, it's very easy to say, OK, stay as a campaigner, stay out of the, you know, stay clean. But obviously, if you do go in and you get deep into an organization and you become influential within that organization, a business organization, then that's power. You do have power, and that's important. Thank you. I just wanted to go ahead and follow this up. Um, this is where I've often been associated with is nature conservation. So the obvious track is to join uh, the wildlife trust or the RSPP or something. Uh, but it's actually equally important, if not more influential, to join um, the Atkins or something like that as an ecological consultant, junior to begin with, work your way up. So that you're then actually hands-on on the different projects uh, of various developers might or might not be doing. So that it, it's uh, it makes the economy. So we need some people who are campaigning, yes. some people within organisations that are doing these things as well. Um, and uh, different people's temperaments will guide them in different directions. Uh, and, uh, but we do need people, I think, within the organisations as well as outside campaigners. I think that's true. I think, however, we probably also need to look after the people who are inside the organisation. So I think it can be very lonely and very difficult. And I also know quite a lot of people who think they are doing radical work within organisations. And I know that they are constantly being, you know, their, their universe of what they think possible is constantly being limited by the corporate culture. So you need other groupings, informal groupings, peer groupings, expert groupings that help you to sort of enable you, give you strength to challenge. Again, you need allies, not from within, or within your organisation, also not from within your organisation. Yes. If I can just compliment that, I mean, in the game, back into that particular area, there's a thing called the uh, Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, which has a whole lot of uh, consultants in it, and some people from the NGO sector, but uh, its main strength is 